Company Guide to TSGT October 1, 2023, 134. Section 18C, Code of Conduct 18.11, Responsibilities under the Code of Conduct. The Code of Conduct is a moral code designed to provide U.S. military personnel with a standard of conduct that all members are expected to measure up to. The six articles of the Code of Conduct were designed to address situations that any member could encounter to some degree. It includes basic information useful to prisoners of war to help them survive honorably while resisting captors' efforts to exploit them. It is also applicable to service members subject to other hostile detention, such as hostage scenarios. Survival and resistance in hostile situations require knowledge and understanding of the six articles. Violations of the Code of Conduct are not criminally punishable per se, but actions that also violate the Uniform Code of Military Justice, UCMJ, may subject members to disciplinary action. Code of Conduct Training Department of Defense personnel who plan, schedule, commit, or control members of the U.S. Armed Forces must fully understand the Code of Conduct and ensure personnel have the training and education necessary to abide by it. The level of knowledge members need depends on how likely they are to be captured, their exposure to sensitive information, and how useful or valuable a captor considers them to be. Code of Conduct training is conducted at three levels, briefly described here. Level A, Entry Level Training. Level A training represents the minimum level of understanding needed for all members of the U.S. Armed Forces. This level is imparted to all personnel during entry training. Level B, Training After Assumption of Duty Eligibility. Level B training is an enhanced version of training from Level A. It is the minimum level of understanding needed for service members whose military jobs, specialties, or assignments entail moderate risk of capture, such as members of ground combat units. Training is conducted for such service members as soon as their assumption of duty makes them eligible. Level C Training upon Assumption of Duties or Responsibilities Level C training is an enhanced version of training from levels A and B. It is the minimum level of understanding needed for military service members whose military jobs, specialties, or assignments entail significant or high risk of capture and whose position, rank, or seniority makes them vulnerable to greater than average exploitation efforts by a captor. Examples include air crews and special mission forces, such as pararescue teams. Training for these members is conducted upon their assumption of the duties or responsibilities that make them eligible. 18.12. The Articles of the Code of Conduct President Dwight D. Eisenhower first published the Code of Conduct for members of the U.S. Armed Forces on August 17, 1955. In March 1988, President Ronald W. Reagan amended the code with gender-neutral language. The six articles of the Code of Conduct are listed below, followed by an explanation of each article and significant aspects of that article. Study Guide to TSGT October 1, 2023, 135 Article I I am an American, fighting in the forces which guard my country and our way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. Article 2 I will never surrender of my own free will. If in command, I will never surrender the members of my command while they still have the means to resist. Article 3 If I am captured, I will continue to resist by all means available. I will make every effort to escape and aid others to escape. I will accept neither parole nor special favors from the enemy. Article 4 if I become a prisoner of war, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I will give no information or take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. If I am senior, I will take command. If not, I will obey the lawful orders of those appointed over me and will back them up in every way. Article V When questioned, should I become a prisoner of war, I am required to give name, rank, service number, and date of birth. I will evade answering further questions to the utmost of my ability. I will make no oral or written statements disloyal to my country, 
and its allies are harmful to their cause. Article 6 I will never forget that I am an American, fighting for freedom, responsible for my actions, and dedicated to the principles which made my country free. I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. Article I Article 1 applies to all members at all times. A member of the U.S. Armed Forces has a duty to support U.S. interests and oppose U.S. enemies regardless of the circumstances, whether in active combat or captivity. Past experiences of captured Americans reveals that honorable survival and captivity requires a high degree of dedication and motivation. Maintaining these qualities requires knowledge of and a strong belief in the advantages of American democratic institutions and concepts. Maintaining these qualities also requires a love of and faith in the United States and a conviction that the United States cause is just. Honorable survival in captivity depends on faith in, and loyalty to, fellow prisoners of war. Note. Possessing the dedication and motivation fostered by such beliefs and trust may help prisoners of war survive long, stressful. Study Guide to TSGT October 1, 2023, 136 Periods of Captivity and has helped many return to their country and families with their honor and self-esteem intact. Article 2 Members of the U.S. Armed Forces may never surrender voluntarily. Even when isolated and no longer able to inflict casualties on the enemy or otherwise defend themselves, their duty is to evade capture and rejoin the nearest friendly force. Surrender is the willful act of giving oneself up to the enemy. In contrast, capture occurs when a member has no means to resist, evasion is impossible, and further fighting would lead to death of the U.S. member with no significant loss to the enemy. Capture dictated by overwhelming enemy strength and the futility of fighting is not dishonorable. Service members must understand and have confidence in search and recovery forces rescue procedures and techniques, and proper evasion destination procedures. Note, under the UCMJ, a U.S. commander who shamefully surrenders to the enemy, any command or place that is his or her duty to defend, is subject to punishment. In addition, any person subject to the UCMJ who compels or attempts to compel a commander of any place, vessel, aircraft, or other military property, or of any body of members of the armed forces, to give it up to an enemy or to abandon it, or who strikes the colors or flag to an enemy without proper authority, is subject to punishment. Article 3 a U.S. Armed Forces member's duty to continue to resist enemy exploitation by all means available is not lessened by the misfortune of capture. Contrary to the 1949 Geneva Conventions, enemies that United States forces have engaged since 1949 have treated the prisoner of war compound as an extension of the battlefield. The prisoner of war must be prepared for this. Enemies have used a variety of tactics to exploit prisoners of war for propaganda purposes or to obtain military information, in spite of Geneva Convention prohibitions. Physical and mental harassment, general mistreatment, torture, medical neglect, and political indoctrination have all been used, and the enemy has tried to tempt prisoners of war to accept special favors or privileges in return for statements or information, or for a pledge by the prisoner of war not to attempt escape. A prisoner of war must not seek special privileges or accept special favors at the expense of fellow. Prisoners of War Under the guidance and supervision of the senior military person, the prisoner of war must be prepared to take advantage of escape opportunities. In communal detention, the welfare of the prisoners of war who remain behind must be considered. Additionally, prisoners of war should not sign or enter into a parole agreement. Parole agreements are promises the prisoners of war make to the captor to fulfill stated conditions, such as not to bear arms, in exchange for special privileges, such as release or lessened restraint. Members should understand that captivity involves continuous control by a captor who may attempt to use the prisoner of war as a source of information for political purposes or as a potential subject for political indoctrination. Members must familiarize themselves with prisoner of war and captor rights and obligations under the Geneva Conventions, 
understanding that some captors have accused prisoners of war of being war criminals simply because they waged war against them. Continued efforts to escape are critical because a successful escape causes the enemy to divert forces that may otherwise be fighting, provides the United States valuable information about the enemy and other prisoners of war, and serves as a positive example to all members of the U.S. Armed Forces Study Guide to TSGT October 1, 2023, 137 Article 4 Officers and enlisted members continue to carry out their responsibilities and exercise authority in captivity. Informing, or any other action detrimental to a fellow prisoner of war, is despicable and expressly forbidden. Prisoners of war must avoid helping the enemy identify fellow prisoners of war who may have valuable knowledge to the enemy. Strong leadership is essential to discipline. Without discipline, camp organization, resistance, and even survival may be impossible. Personal hygiene, camp sanitation, and care of the sick and wounded are imperative. Wherever located, prisoners of war must organize in a military manner under the senior military prisoner of war, regardless of military service. If the senior prisoner of war is incapacitated or otherwise unable to act, the next senior prisoner of war assumes command. Members must be trained to understand and accept leadership from those in command and abide by the decisions of the senior prisoner of war, regardless of military service. Failing to do so may result in punishment under the UCMJ. Additionally, a prisoner of war who voluntarily informs or collaborates with the captor is a traitor to the United States and fellow prisoners of war, and after repatriation, is subject to punishment under the UCMJ. Service members must be familiar with the principles of hygiene, sanitation, health maintenance, first aid, physical conditioning, and food utilization. Article V. When questioned, a prisoner of war is required by the Geneva Conventions and permitted by the UCMJ to give name, rank, service number, and date of birth. Under the Geneva Conventions, the enemy has no right to try to force a prisoner of war to provide any additional information. However, it is unrealistic to expect a prisoner of war to remain confined for years reciting only name, rank, service number, and date of birth. Many prisoners of war camp situations exist in which certain types of conversation with the enemy are permitted. For example, a prisoner of war is allowed, but not required by the Code of Conduct, the UCMJ or the Geneva Conventions, to fill out a Geneva Conventions capture card, to write letters home, and to communicate with captors on matters of health and welfare. The senior prisoner of war is required to represent prisoners of war in matters of camp administration, health, welfare, and grievances. A prisoner of war must resist, avoid, or evade, even when physically and mentally coerced, all enemy efforts to Secure statements or actions that may further the enemy's cause. Examples of statements or actions prisoners of war should resist include giving oral or written confessions, answering questionnaires, providing personal history statements, and making propaganda recordings and broadcast appeals to other prisoners of war to comply with improper captor demands. Additionally, prisoners of war should resist appealing for United States surrender or parole, engaging in self-criticism or providing oral or written statements or communication that are harmful to the United States, its allies, the U.S. Armed Forces, or other prisoners of war. Experience has shown that, although enemy interrogation sessions may be harsh and cruel, a prisoner of war can usually resist if there is a will to resist. The best way for a prisoner of war to keep faith with the United States' fellow prisoners of war, and him or herself, is to provide the enemy with as little information as possible. Service members familiarize themselves with the various aspects of interrogation, including phases, procedures, methods, and techniques, as well as the interrogator's goals, strengths, and weaknesses. Members should avoid disclosing information by such techniques as claiming inability to furnish information because of previous orders, poor memory, ignorance, or lack of comprehension. They should understand that, short of death, it is unlikely that a prisoner of war will prevent a skilled enemy interrogator, using all available psychological and physical methods of coercion, from obtaining some degree of compliance. 
However, the prisoner of war must recover as quickly as possible and resist successive efforts to the utmost. Study Guide to TSGT October 1, 2023, 138. Article 6. A member of the U.S. Armed Forces remains responsible for personal actions at all times. When repatriated, prisoners of war can expect their actions to be subject to review, including both circumstances of capture and conduct during detention. The purpose of such a review is to recognize meritorious performance and, if necessary, investigate any allegations of misconduct. Such reviews are conducted with due regard for the rights of the individual and consideration for the conditions of captivity. Members should understand the difference between the Code of Conduct as a moral code and the UCMJ as a legal code. Members should understand that failure to follow the Code of Conduct could ultimately lead them to commit misconduct punishable under the UCMJ. Members should also understand that the U.S. government will use every available means to establish contact with prisoners of war, to support them, and to obtain their release. Furthermore, U.S. laws provide for the support and care of dependents of the U.S. Armed forces, including prisoners of war family members. Military members must ensure their personal affairs and family matters are up to date at all times. Note, no United States prisoner of war will be forgotten. Every available means will be employed to establish contact with, support, and obtain the release of all our U.S. prisoners of war. 18.13. Detention of U.S. military personnel in operations other than war. U.S. military personnel isolated from U.S. control are still required to do everything in their power to follow Department of Defense and USAF policy and survive with honor. Basic protections available to prisoners of war under the Geneva Conventions may not be adhered to during operations other than war. Thus, personnel detained may be subject to the domestic criminal laws of the detaining nation. These personnel should use the Code of Conduct as a moral guide to assist them to uphold the ideals of Department of Defense policy and survive their ordeal with honor. Rationale Because of their wide range of activities, U.S. military personnel are subject to detention by unfriendly governments or captivity by terrorist groups. When a hostile government or terrorist group detains or captures U.S. military personnel, the captor is often attempting to exploit both the individual and the U.S. government for its own purposes. As history has shown, exploitation can take many forms, such as hostage confessions to crimes never committed, international news media exploitation, and substantial ransom demands, all of which can lead to increased credibility and support for the detainer. Responsibility U.S. military personnel detained by unfriendly governments or held hostage by a terrorist group must do everything in their power to survive with honor. Furthermore, whether United States military personnel are detained or held hostage, they can be sure the U.S. government will make every effort to obtain their release. To best survive the situation, military personnel must maintain faith in their country, in fellow detainees or captives, and most importantly, in themselves. In any group captivity situation, military captives must organize to the fullest extent possible under the senior military member present. If civilians are part of the group, they should be encouraged to participate. United States military personnel must make every reasonable effort to prevent captors from exploiting them and the U.S. government. If exploitation cannot be prevented, military members must attempt to limit it. If detainees convince their captors of their low propaganda value, the captors may seek a quick end to the situation. When a detention or hostage situation ends, military members who can honestly say they did their utmost to resist exploitation will have upheld Department of Defense policy the founding principles of the United States, and the highest traditions of military service. Military Bearing and Courtesy U.S. military personnel shall maintain military bearing. Study Guide to TSGT October 1, 2023, 139 Regardless of the type of detention or captivity or brutality of treatment, they should make every effort to remain calm and courteous and project personal dignity, 
particularly during the process of capture and the early stages of internment when captors may be uncertain of their control over the captives. Discourteous, non-military behavior seldom serves long-term interests of a detainee or hostage and often results in unnecessary punishment that serves no useful purpose. Such behavior may jeopardize survival and complicate efforts to gain release of the detainee or hostage. Guidance for Detention by Governments Detainees in the custody of an unfriendly government, regardless of the circumstances that resulted in the detention, are subject to the laws of that government. Detainees must maintain military bearing and avoid aggressive, combative, or illegal behavior that may complicate their situation, legal status, or efforts to negotiate a rapid release. As American citizens, detainees should ask immediately and continually to see United States Embassy personnel or a representative of an allied or neutral government. United States military personnel who become lost or isolated in an unfriendly foreign country during operations other than war will not act as combatants during evasion attempts. During operations other than war, there is no protection afforded under the Geneva Convention. The civil laws of that country apply. A detainer's goal may be maximum political exploitation. Detained U.S. military personnel must be cautious in all they say and do. In addition to asking for a U.S. representative, detainees should provide name, rank, service number, date of birth, and the innocent circumstances leading to their detention. They should limit further discussions to health and welfare matters, conditions of their fellow detainees, and going home. Detainees should avoid signing documents or making statements. If forced, they must provide as little information as possible. U.S. military detainees should not refuse release, unless doing so requires them to compromise their honor or cause damage to the U.S. government or its allies. Attempting to escape by unfriendly governments is not recommended by Department of Defense policy except under life-threatening circumstances. This is because attempted or actual escape from a government confinement facility will likely constitute a violation of the unfriendly government's criminal law and may subject the escapee to increased criminal prosecution. Terrorist hostage. Capture by terrorists is generally the least predictable and structured form of operations. Capture can range from a spontaneous kidnapping to a carefully planned hijacking. In either situation, Hostages play an important role in determining their own fate because terrorists rarely expect to receive rewards for providing good treatment or releasing victims unharmed. U.S. Military members should assume their captors are genuine terrorists when it is unclear if they are surrogates of a government. A terrorist hostage situation is more volatile than a government detention, so members must take steps to lessen the chance of a terrorist indiscriminately killing hostages. In such a situation, Department of Defense policy accepts and promotes efforts to establish rapport between United States hostages and the terrorists to establish themselves as people in the terrorists' mind, rather than a stereotypical symbol of a country the terrorists may. Hate Department of Defense policy recommends U.S. personnel stay away from topics that could inflame terrorist sensibilities, such as their cause, politics, or religion. Listening can be vitally important when survival is at stake. Members should not argue, patronize, or debate issues with the captors. During rescue attempts, hostages should take cover, remain stationary when practicable, and not attempt to help rescuers. Hostages may experience rough handling from the rescuers until the rescuers separate the terrorists from the hostages.